Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today we talk with our colleague, Greg Diamond, editor of our 10 Stock Trader publication. And Corey and I will talk about Hertz selling a third of its electric vehicle fleet and the implications for that in the economy. And remember, if you want to ask us a question or tell us what's on your mind, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. All right, let's talk about Hertz. I have to admit, I was a little shocked by this one. Um, it's all over, all over the place. Reuters, Bloomberg, um, other, other places. And, um, <laughs> okay. So let me just read a little bit from the Bloomberg article. Hertz global holdings plans to sell a third of its U S electric vehicle fleet and reinvest in gas powered cars due to weak demand and high repair costs for its battery-powered options. Does any of that surprise you? Uh, all of it surprised uh, a, a, me. A lot of it. Um, a lot of it. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I guess when, when I hear the headline, like it wasn't a headline I was expecting, or a, sorry, a business move I was expecting to read about. Mm-hmm. But then once you hear the details, yes, it makes a lot of sense. I guess so, yeah. Especially, the weak demand surprised me because I thought, well, you know, electric vehicles are here and people just like them and that's okay because they're fun to drive. I've driven, um, I guess I drove a hybrid a few times and I've driven a pure electric. I drove a Model S, lots of fun, pushed me back in the seat, took off like a rocket. So the weak demand surprised me a little bit, but the high repair cost for battery powered options, maybe that shouldn't have surprised us because it's new tech. It's still relatively new. I know I know electric cars have been around for like a century or something, but you know th- these are fairly new, and they've come up as a percent of you know total global car sales really fast in the past you know just call it several years here. So I thought, well, you know they're here. This is it. People want electric cars, but <laughs> but the high repair costs. It's like we can't afford to repair them, and nobody wants them. <laughs> Uh oh. So we're getting rid of a third of our electric vehicle fleet, yeah. and we're taking a 245 million related incremental net depreciation charge on these. And part of that has to be from the price cuts, you know, from Tesla's price. From cuts, Tesla. Right? From Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this story is there's so many different layers to it with so many different industries and trends uh, globally. I mean, obviously, it's like, okay, there's the, uh, the big push for EVs, uh, you know, globally or, and nationally, but then there's like the practical matters, right? Like, okay, we're talking about the rental business, like cars are going to get into problems. You got to fix them. People, their preferences. I, I think part of the reason for the weaker demand too, is like, if you're renting a car in a different city or, you know, at an airport, you're not familiar with, and you got to figure out how to, where to charge this thing. Uh, nobody wants to do that if they're on like a two day business trip or a a week, a vacation with their family or something. Um, more than once, I would say, I would say like somebody might try it and then like, oh crap, I got to find out where to charge this thing in, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York or wherever. It's, uh, I think that's, that's part of it too, which it's different if you own one, I think you're used to that, but renting it is a bit, I think a bit more challenging. I've been in a I've been in a Tesla Uber and it was cool too. Like late at night, I was staring out the ceiling, um, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, on the, on the open roof. But yeah, I mean that was just an Uber. Uh, it's, I don't have any expenses on that one. Another thing that um, surprised me is that uh, Bloomberg has a whole thing. I think it's even a print magazine called Bloomberg Green, and Michael Bloomberg is all, you know, hyped up about the big climate scam or whatever, and. The headline on Bloomberg reads, Hertz to sell 20,000 EVs in shift back to gas-powered cars. You'd think Bloomberg would not frame it like that. It's like Bloomberg saying, you know, okay, well, we tried. (laughs) This is it. It's over. Um, People want gas-powered cars, and car rental companies can't afford to have electric vehicles, so they're going back to gas-powered cars. 
gas powered cars are better. <laughs> That's what we say here at Bloomberg. I mean, it's a, it's that message is subtle if there at all, but I just, the way they frame it, they, they frame their headlines in a particular way. And I, that one caught me off guard, but I'll tell you, we're talking about who was surprised by this. Um, Hertz, of course, they're, you know, they're taking a $245 million charge, but in 2021, they announced plans to buy a hundred thousand Tesla vehicles. And they they were buying them from another firm too. They weren't just buying Teslas, but a hundred thousand of them. And didn't so get I don't there. know how. Yeah, didn't, didn't get close, right? Doesn't yeah, it doesn't sound like yeah. it. I mean, their total vehicle fleet is like sixty thousand. So and that yeah. was that was in twenty twenty one, right? When they announced they were they were going to buy uh, Teslas and, and EVs and add them to their fleet, and it, that was what pushed Tesla's market cap uh, over a trillion, I believe, at the time. And this remember this 2021 right this was like prime uh we're at prime bubble season there and it was right. yep rates were still at zero inflation nobody was t- caring about inflation at that point uh everybody was still on the pandemic stimulus high and times have changed uh in, the, in two years and now they're selling these cars back into the market at like twenty thousand dollars less than each than what where they bought them at hertz you're also gonna have like a bunch of used teslas and evs on the market too um yeah which i don't will people buy them at that point too that'll be another thing to see about demand for you know individuals buying them maybe maybe they will at that point if they're they're cheap enough right right when in the fourth quarter of 2023 um electric vehicle sales growth in the u.s slowed way way down rising just uh, 1.3 percent in the fourth quarter year over year from the fourth quarter of the previous year so yeah not good the whole thing looks like it's uh going into reverse for some period of time here yeah it reminds me of something uh i think our doc eifrig wrote in uh, one of his publications like several years ago about just how long it's going to take even okay even if there is demand for evs and they're produced consistently like just how long it would take for them all to overtake the gas power cars in the market and i don't think that pace is even close to happening at this point and i don't know it just speaks to how gas and you know fossil fuels are still the dominant player in autos unless like gm where like what are gm and ford doing or you know these other companies like what are i mean why can't they compete with tesla as much i guess you know they're um they started way behind uh you know they got like 10 or 15 years to catch up on on everything so um unless they unless evs get affordable and more efficient you know when when you like what you said when when they break you know and um you know cheaper to fix and, and all that stuff so maybe the story would be different right you're talking about these other competitors of tesla oh and by the way Hertz also has an agreement to buy 175,000 General Motors electric vehicles over the next four years and 65,000 from Polestar. And, uh, you know, they're saying, well, you know, we're going to keep an eye on that. And <laughs> they take much longer to complete those orders. So, um, yeah, it sounds like we should be surprised if that ever happens with, with GM. Yeah, that's right. It should be surprising because that's a hell of a lot of cars. This whole thing, though, it's, it's one thing when you're responding to demand, right? Hey, people want electric cars. And I thought, well, at first I thought it was a big green push. It was all subsidized. You know, people didn't really want them as much as the, you know, as Tesla and other makers were assuming. And then I thought, well, okay, you know, they're growing sales like crazy. And, you know, it's, it's an increasing percentage of global sales like year after year. Okay, well, um, maybe maybe this is real. But I don't know. Maybe it's not as real. And, and <clears throat> not only that, but the more I look into, you know, all of the claims by all of the hysterical climate folks, just one after another of them kind of falls by the wayside and turns into, hmm, at least something questionable, if not outright fraudulent in, in some cases. Like, I, you know, I found out like... NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, there's like, you know, 20 odd thousand these weather stations around the U.S. And I think they're up to at least 300 and 
50 or so um, that have shut down, but Noah's still fabricating the data for them. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay. And and the whole thing was born, I feel like, with Al Gore and his hockey stick graph that came from a guy named Michael Mann, which has been called out and proved as fabricated like many times. So anyway, I don't want to get into all that, even though I just did. Yeah. But the point is, like, maybe the wheels are falling off this whole thing, literally, <laughs> now, uh, you know, in the form of all these problems with electric vehicles that Hertz is having. So I have no doubt we'll have plenty of electric vehicles, and we'll have more of them, you know, 10 years from now than today, probably, I'm going to guess. But, uh, you know, they're not taking over the world, and they're certainly not going to be 100% of the fleet anytime, probably in our lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it's not a shoe in to you know, change gas powered cars to EVs in uh, five years. Like that is not happening by any stretch of the imagination at all. It's got a long road ahead of us. You know, whatever you think about climate, I don't, I don't honestly don't even know what, what to think about it. Um, like these things are going to take time, no matter what the goals are. I mean, I, we talk, I talked about nuclear a couple of weeks ago, like that's part of this uh, push too uh, among uh advanced economies are looking at nuclear looking at different sources i mean but still i mean if you need a if you need to get a, a new you know hvac unit or something you're still the option the cheapest option most affordable option is uh hooking it up to to gas right and it's it's like those types of things these these are going to take a long time to change if if at all um so it's uh hertz is Hertz is going back to gas cars. So there we have it. Nothing has changed in the last 15 years. <laughs> right. And nothing really has changed. The global energy mix hasn't changed. Um, a guy named mm, Jeff Curie from Goldman Sachs, and I wrote about this in the Ferris Report a short while back. Uh, he looked at the global energy mix. And he said, you know, it's something like, I don't know, I think the figure was like $4 trillion bucks has been put into this thing in the last 10 years. And, you know, the world has built um, solar farms or whatever you call them and wind farms. So they've built plenty of this stuff, but the global energy mix hasn't changed. Fossil fuels are still, I think it's 82% of the global energy mix, like hasn't moved, <laughs> you know? And so they're, they're building this stuff everywhere. And, and those technologies are problematic, right? The situation like with the whales on the east coast of the United States, gosh, that, that breaks my heart. And they're not even, they, they claim that they're not sure what's doing it, but I don't know. It seems like maybe that's, uh, that's not genuine on the part of the uh, you know, utilities and the folks doing the wind farms. And, and I've seen pictures of like massive solar installations in China where they just like coat the landscape with these things. It's like, ooh, that's environmentally friendly. Ooh, that is so ugly. But they're out there, but they have not changed the global energy mix. So, you know, fossil fuels are just too darn good. I know. And you look at, so like what's happening right now in, in geopolitics and, and in the Red Sea, right? You talk about the disruption yeah. to shipping channels and what that's doing to oil prices, natural gas prices. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. and, and then commodities, um, these are things that like the market's re reacting to that, right? That, that, that more than I think mm -hmm. EV use uh, in the short term, like that, that's, uh, yeah. we got oil prices up, you know, like 3% in a day when something is happening in, in the Red Sea. And yeah. I think those things are more important to think about certainly in the short term and probably in the, the longer term as well as in terms of like what, how this affects investments and energy companies and um, all those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, EVs yeah, are cool exactly. to talk about, you know, maybe they are the future. Maybe they're not. They still need to pull things out of the ground to power them and make them go. Like it's, it, so let's, <laughs> let's be real about, about what we're, what we're looking at. Um, right. And I mean, people younger, you know, the younger generation doesn't want to hear about oil and gas, but they also don't know. And we, I'll include myself in that, like everything that 
like I'm look you look around a computer uh, wires like everything that is made from plastic and you know derives from chemicals and oils like I don't be careful what what we wish for and and trying to speed this along so quickly without knowing the consequences about it not that's not to say it's not worth doing not worth you know make, innovating and, and doing things but like it's not going to happen overnight no this the green push I'm talking about yeah, not going to happen overnight if it ever happens at all during our lifetime. Yep. Um, and it, and you're right. It's um, the macro force moving oil, you know, and it's, as we speak, pushing 74 bucks a barrel is not green energy transition. It's where's the, you know, where's the oil going to go if it can't move around in the Red Sea? So, and the overall demand too, like global demand and supply and from OPEC and, you know, all these things that, Yep. Uh, are affecting that, you know, energy prices right now. Yeah, that's what's moving energy prices, not electric vehicles. Yeah. And the idea also, you know, you, you'll still talk to somebody now and then who'll say, well, you know, oil's a bad bet. It's a, you know, the, the demand is just going to go down and down and down the more we use these electric vehicles. I'm like, you're not within the ballpark of sanity with that. It just makes no sense. As you pointed out, for example, an incredibly fossil fuel intensive process called mining <laughs> um, has to happen. And a lot of copper has to be mined. In fact, a lot of copper has to be mined just for normal GDP growth, regardless of electric vehicle use. Never mind that electric vehicles, many of them use, you know, four or more times the amount of copper as an internal combustion engine vehicle. Never mind that. Just normal GDP growth. And we're going to need, Robert Friedland, the, the copper magnate, says basically eight Escondida mines over the next approximately eight years. So even if he's off by eight years, you know, even if it's one every two years, not one every year, you know, there aren't eight of those deposits in existence. Escondida is the largest copper mine in the world. There aren't eight of those deposits in existence, period. So, you know... I think copper's still a good bet, you know, over the next, whatever, five, 10 years. But um, it's, I don't know, decreasingly do I believe it'll be heavily dependent on this green energy transition. It's just the green energy transition too problematic, as you keep pointing out, you know, even without Dan's views about, you know, the climate crazies, it's ju just making it happen, even if it's all real and it all has to happen right? because we're right. saving the planet physically can't do it so we're in a we're in an interesting position here i wonder and and of course time magazine has recently informed us that the 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 climate industrial complex is a trillion dollar a year undertaking globally so that is you know that's a big piece of the global economy and I'm curious to see how it all works out over just the next year or two or three. Yeah, me too. What I'm hearing is more spending, government spending too, and mm -hmm. higher prices for everything. That's that's what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, inflation basically going on and on. You know, if we're talking about copper shortages um, for all of these things that will that government money will be put towards like i'm pretty confident in that and whether they work or not whether people want them or not um, whether they make business sense or not for people who actually like want to make money um what <laughs> whether all of that happens the, the government's going to keep spending money that much i am confident in and we only have a limited supply right now of natural resources and, and energy and we're only getting more people on on old planet earth and so it's mm -hmm. i don't see anything changing you know for, or for the inflation picture anytime soon even if you know central banks whatever do what they whatever they think they can do to lower it in the in the short term um i don't think i uh, you know i think people are worried they're no they'll they'll never have enough money to keep up with higher prices yeah which it's odd. I mean, here we are in early 2024, and you can make that statement reasonably. Uh, and the whole narrative for, you know, most of last year was inflation's coming down, inflation's coming down. But, you know, inflation is like governments borrowing money and doing the things that governments do with it. 
primarily. And if they keep the fire under them for, you know, the green transition, um, I agree. It's, that's, it's a fundamentally inflationary trend. All right. Well, I guess, I guess it sounds like you and I are right now saying we don't believe the, the narrative. That, inf- that inflation is crushed? Yeah, that inflation yeah. is permanently crushed and that it's over. I know I don't. Well, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know you don't either. I know I don't either. You sh- <laughs> you share that chart before of what is it CPI, you know, like nominally, right over the over however long, right, and it's just straight up and to the right. Yep, the the actual index, not the year over year changes. Yeah, it just it never goes anywhere but up, and people yep. say, well, you know, it's all it's all about the rate of change. Uh, sure, but you know, tell a struggling couple who's got a baby on the way. <laughs> Right. You know. It is about the rate of change for the market. It is not about the rate of change most of the time for regular people unless uh, until when it, you know, prices go up 20% and don't go back down. Like that's, you know, yeah, that's when people notice. Right. All right. Well, <clears throat> all right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where we're going with this, but um you know, we're not liking a couple of situations here. The 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 future of, you know, the the green energy push and government's willingness to borrow and spend to make try to make it happen is is not i don't think it's a net benefit for humanity yeah i would just say it's it's to me it's more of just an inflationary pressure a big one um that isn't never going away i don't think and it's just what we need to consider like as central banks say they can tighten and and beat down inflation like yeah, they can to do this in this paperwork world of that th- that they live in, um, mm-hmm. you know, of of rate of change and CPIs of point one percent and two percent and three percent. But like, you know, add it all up, and fundamentally, like you said, it's it's still uh, government spending, inflation, not going anywhere. Right. All right. I think we agree on that, and uh, let's move on and talk with our guest we know our guest very well he's a friend and colleague and um one of the finest traders that we know his name is greg diamond and he called us and said man i got something to say so i'm i really am excited for you to hear what he has to say as always let's do it let's talk with greg diamond right now nvidia may be america's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone But if you're holding NVIDIA or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the $7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular on many major news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC, and he built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed buy on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found NVIDIA at the start of 2023 before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from NVIDIA. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, Mark says. In fact, it just flashed by on a totally different AI stock. And today... He'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at www.aifrenzyreport.com. Again, that's www.aifrenzyreport.com for a free copy of his new report. Greg, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for having me on again. Okay, so once again, I, I feel like I need to tell people that mostly when people contact us and want to be a guest on the show, I don't pay it much mind, and I just move on, and they don't get on the show. But when someone I know well and you know whose work I have a lot of respect for contacts me and says, you need to have me back on, I don't question it. I go with it immediately. You may recall we had Vitaly Katzenelson on the show because he said, look, I need to get on. I need to talk about something. And I had him right on. 
Um, in this case, I guess we didn't get right on it. It's been about a month, I think, since the first time Greg contacted me via Twitter. I think you tweeted, you replied to something on Twitter. And, um, but, ev- but here we are. Here we All are. All that to say, here we are. And I'm dying, just dying, Greg, pal of mine, to find out what is on your mind. Well, there's a lot, actually. Uh, and, you know, it, some of this is probably consensus in the fact that, you know, 2024, I'm expecting an incredible range of volatility. And you can go down the fundamental catalyst that most everyone wants to talk about. Number one being the U.S. election. But that's in November. OK. Um, but before that, there's a lot more happening. And the first thing I w- I'll talk about is. And I wrote about this to my subscribers last week or two weeks ago, is that. The general consensus among investors, you know, among the financial media is what? The Fed has beaten inflation. Everything is going to be fine. And they're going to start cutting rates, if not start QE. So, and everyone's on that side of the bus. And usually when that happens, the opposite happens. So, and some of the cycle stuff that I look at tells me that the opposite will happen. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to see, you know, a rise to 10% on the on the tenure or anything crazy like that. But what the market loves to do is hurt the most people. And if everyone is thinking that the Fed's going to start cutting rates, that they're going to start QE, that everything is fine, the opposite's usually going to happen. So I'm I'm expecting that. Um it doesn't mean that we're going to have, you know, a a 2020 COVID like crash. It will probably be more of a 2022 type scenario where you see these huge moves up and huge moves down, uh, which for me as an options trader is fantastic. So that that's kind of you know just the basic premise of why I wanted to go on and and you know and that that'll kind of start our conversation. But and I, I have more to talk about. Um, but that's kind of why I wanted to get on and be like, okay, starting January, like fireworks are are, are going to pop off because when you also look at positioning, um, I saw a chart not too long ago, and if you look at the extreme positioning and just in the futures markets of, you know, net longs and then net shorts just over a three year period, it's astronomical the level that these swings are are happening. And that's not going to change anytime soon, because when you look at inflation, when you look at Fed, when you look at, you know, the United States election and and to throw it all in the mix, Russia has an election in May. Um, you know, you throw all these earnings, you know, what's that going to look like? We're going to see these huge swings in positioning again. Um, so again, as an options trader, I'm really excited about that potential environment. Sounds good. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it's, uh, I think we both have the same sort of contrarian instinct here, but yours is much more based on your study of cycles, right? You're, you're not just like with me, I see, you know, a year like we just had, um, interest rates being where they are, uh, having the same contrarian impulse that, that you do about, you know, this belief in cuts is kind of overdone. And then I look at the overall valuation, you know, CAPE ratio and price to sales and all the usual stuff I yammer about, um, which I did in the last digest this, you know, last week or whatever. Uh, that's where I come from. But with you, it's different. You're not looking at that stuff. So tell me more about, um, I, we talk about this every time you're on, but I think it's necessary because it's not something most folks know much about. Tell me more about your study of cycles and how that gets you to where you are right now. So time analysis is uh, hard. It's dynamic because you have short-term cycles, you have medium-term cycles, you have long-term cycles, but they're all in play all the time and timing matters in the market. So you can be the biggest contrarian, but you know, if you were short Nvidia in January, 2023, you know, it rallied 300%. I mean, you know, well, this is overdone. Well, yeah, maybe, (laughs) you know, you can get some of that right some of the time, but you have to know when, and that when is time. And I write about this all the time, you know, that I'm not necessarily concerned about the why it doesn't mean that I don't focus on, you know, again, you know, what the inflation is going to do or what the Fed might do or earnings or, you know, how the election or this election might pan out. What, you know, what some CEO said, all that stuff matters. But determining when something is going to happen is is my bread and butter, because as an options trader, I have to be able to understand when. And when we talk about time, we're talking about GAN analysis, the famous WD GAN, a legendary trader back in the early 1900s. But to understand how these time cycles work takes a lot of work, but it's something that 
you, you know, you mentioned how you, you, you look at things in, in the contrarian mindset. That's true. And, you know, being on social media, I'm not a huge social media presence, but I, the reason why I got on it, especially over the last few years, is to follow some of these folks who just have this instinct of calling these big market moves at the exact wrong time. So that is something that I like to incorporate. But the main thing is really about when, just like I said at the start, when everyone's on the same side, that tends to be the best time to get in, you know, and then you start factoring in these shorter term or medium term time cycles. Uh, and that's a lot of what I cover in 10 stock trader. So, you know, I don't have, you know, if you had 20 years to, for me to explain time analysis, I could do that, but you know, we have a limited time, but you know, WD Gann said it best time is the most important factor in trading and investing, um, then price, then fundamentals. And it's a very hard concept for, I'm sure some of your readers to comprehend. It was hard for me to comprehend, you know, starting out and Paul Tudor Jones, legendary hedge fund trader was actually the first one where I, I heard that concept, you know, time price comes first and then fundamentals follow. And, and it took me years to really understand what that means. But then once I did, it just kind of clicks and you're like, ah, I get it now. And so what that means is that, you know, you see these patterns develop, you see these time cycles develop, then the move happens and then the fundamentals come, oh, well, this is why that happened. But you want to be in, ahead of that fundamental catalyst or fundamental move uh, to make, you know, really good trading decisions. Right. That just that last nugget is super important. Time and price move before fundamentals are usually widely understood. Um, you know, you, you do get the odd, you know, genius, fundamental genius who will figure it out ahead of time. And every now and then, you know, even I've gotten ahead of it a little bit, but that's mostly luck over time. My forte is nothing about pr price and time. It's just about finding great businesses and sticking with them, which is completely different from what you're talking about. So let's dig into, like, can you give me any um, either time or price targets? Like, for example, you mentioned, you know, the, the election is a huge fundamental, but that's not till November. But what we just said was we thought time and price would get ahead of that. So... Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a few. And actually this will be, this okay. will be really fun because what we'll do, I'll give you specific time factors for 2024, meaning time cycles that I think are going to be important inflection points. I can't tell you right now whether they're going to be highs or lows, but I will tell you right now uh, in early January what they'll be. And then we'll come back on say November and see if I'm right. Okay. So uh, what I'm looking at right now, you want to write them down? All right, Dan, I'm going to play too. I'm going to play this game too. Okay. So starting off around February 14th, let's call it Valentine's Day. That's going to be an important inflection, inflection point. And then the end of March, call it spring to um, April Fool's, April 1st. Okay. And then we're going to look at um, probably around June 21st. Let's call it June 16th to June 21st. Okay. And then one of the biggest ones that I'm expecting is late August into Labor Day. So call it, I don't know, August 25th to September 5th. Those are the big ones from my cycle work. Now, again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you exactly which one's going to be a high or a low. That's not how, that's not how this game is played. And a lot of people get that wrong. Like, oh, you know, GAN analysis, time factors, if it's going to be a big crash, it's going to be this. That's not how the thing, that's not how this works. The way in which this strategy works is understanding what time cycles matter and we gather time cycles from understanding the past. And then how we, you know, people talk time and price. I, I mentioned it before. How these markets, how, let's just call it the S&P 500. How the S&P 500 trades into those specific time factors that I just mentioned will determine, likely, whether it's a high or a low. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a big crash or a big bottom, but they are inflection points to trade. And as you guys know, that's what I do. I, I, I trade those big inflection points. So that'll be fun. Let's see how that forecast uh, right. plays out. And Greg, I, I'm just fascinated by like WD Gann. You mentioned a couple of times already. How much did you know about him um, before when you were like, I, I don't know, what, what attracted you to his like findings initially? The the initial the initial WD Gann like light bulb going off was I saw a picture of his 1929 forecast that he had published in 1928. And he kind of, I mean, 
he didn't kind of he <laughs> he made this forecast for what the prices will do and into more importantly the time that it would do it and he nailed it i mean 95 90% correlation 95% correl it's unbelievable and so i was like whoa, whoa, whoa how did this guy do this without computers back in 1928 how did he understand that so that I mean, I, you know, and I've always had this insatiable desire to learn and understand and I have an open mind and I don't, you know, I, I don't get caught up in biases like you should only look at balance sheets. And I'm not saying some of that stuff isn't important. Of course it is. You know, Dan looks at long term great business. I get it's it's very important. My grandfather did that. He thought I was crazy for being a trader and doing all the stuff that I'm doing. And he was really good at it. But my whole thing was, you know, I started out a hedge fund. You know, I I, I was doing short-term trading. It's what I was trained to do. And so that kind of led me down a little bit of a different path. But when I saw this guy, WD Gans forecast, I just jumped right into it, you know, really jumped into the deep end, you know, and it's been 20 years in the making and I'll fully admit there are still things about understanding time um, that I'm still learning about, which to me is great because it keeps me on my toes. You know, and obviously the market is always changing. There's always new things to incorporate. So it's not like you can just, you know, wipe your hands and say, you know what? I got this all figured out, fellas. You know, I'll see you on Greg Diamond Island, you know, in 30 years. Um, that's not really how it works. So, you know, that's how, kind of how I got started. And it, it continues to this day of understanding, you know, how these time cycles work, how to incorporate price, and then how to incorporate the fundamental catalysts that go along with it. Yeah, Dan, I don't know. You want to get back into those dates a little bit? That August, September one well, that is, uh, yeah. jumps out to me as being two months ahead of presidential election. See, that's what's fast. That's what's fascinating about it is, is again, I don't know whether it's going to be a low or high, but it's from everything that I study is going to be very, very, very important. Yeah, it is amazing how I mean, just and just from following your work, like it, it is amazing how often these inflection points have lined up with just, you know, very significant moves in the market and very significant events just in general in life and culture. So it's looking forward. We'll, we will see at the end of this year how, how it goes. We will see. Yep. So when I look at this, the first thing that I thought was um, the first date that you mentioned was around Valentine's Day, um, February 14th. And then you're talking end of March until April Fool's. Then it was June 16th to 21st, roughly. And then, of course, that August, September time frame you just mentioned. And it seems like they're all roughly two months apart, just roughly. Um, is there a rhythm like a six week or an eight week rhythm here or is you know, it not you, can, you can follow all the, you know, there's, there's tons of different rhythms, uh, short, again, short term cycles that you can follow, you know, um, like it tends to be like a 28 to 30 day cycle. Um, there, there's, there's a lot, but you know, if, if you take, let, let's take 2022 versus um, 2023, right. 2022 is all over the place. If you just looked at the Nasdaq in 2023, for the most part, you know, it was a it was a pretty smooth rally sans, you know, July to call it October, where it was just kind of down. But it's not the same pattern. So my point is, is again, you can't just have these static cycles and think that you have it all figured out. So, you know, to your point, is that what I was looking at in terms of being at two months apart? Not not really. These are kind of the bigger time cycles that I've been focusing on. But here's a nugget that combines a fundamental catalyst with these time cycles. And that's that late March to early April time factor I mentioned. So let's talk about banks for a second. And I'm mm -hmm. going to start writing about this. Um, and I'm 100% going to trade it. I'm just not exactly sure uh, which way just yet. Um, okay. And it might take some patience, <laughs> but hear me out for a second. And you guys will appreciate this. So you guys, most of your listeners, I'm sure know, you guys know Silicon Valley Bank last year, you know, they, and a bunch of regional banks, they all, you know, they went under, they didn't manage their bond portfolio, which is just, I just can't really fathom that. I mean, imagine the arrogance of a bunch of billionaire bankers who have all these bonds in their portfolio and they're so arrogant and their risk management principles, or should I say lack thereof, that they know that, oh, the Federal Reserve is not going to raise that much. They know how much, how many, how much bonds exposure we have, da, 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 da. And then they do it and they blow up. And then the Fed comes in and says, you know what? It's, it's cool, guys. Don't worry about it. So they introduced this funding program where you get to post your bad bonds at par, right? right. At par. And we give you free cash. 
Now, where, why, why in the land of the free and, you know, free markets, why in the world, if I own a business, can't I do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Why can't I, uh, whatever losses that I have, or if I work at such and such hedge fund or something, or whatever, or, or regardless, you know, you lose money in, in the market as a retail investor. Well, I lost. Why can't I post my losses and you give me cash, right? It's just ridiculous. Right. But that's the world in which we leave, live. All right. So anyway, so fast forward, that program is going to expire in about, um, about a month, two months, March 11th. Okay. Now, the risk is, is that there's no risk and they just say, okay, we're just going to extend it. You know, what, what is the big risk? And it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier with the fundamental catalyst of everybody being on the wrong side of what inflation, if inflation goes higher, if they stop this lending program, because they think that they're going back to a nor- quote unquote normal inflation environment or that the fed, you know, is going to start cutting rates and therefore bonds are going to rally. And so the banks keep those bonds on their books. Guess what happens with the shock of rising inflation and the Fed is not going to cut. Those banks are going to get hammered again. And, you know, what happens if the Federal Reserve gets this one wrong? They they take it off. They say, oh, you know what? The banks are in good shape, blah, 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 blah. Boom. So what I find interesting is that this happens on March 11th. And what happened with the time cycle I mentioned, that's the end of March, beginning of April. So to me, it's kind of like this, you know, we might see this rally into the end of March and or beginning of April, like, hey, everything's fine. The Fed's got it under control. The banks are in good shape. Boom, we get infl- higher inflation. Everyone's got it wrong. And then banks take another tumble. So um, that's one of the big trades that I'm looking for earlier, you know, call it uh, first half of the year. But I again, I'm, I'm not predicting what's going to happen. I'm just saying this is something that I'm um, kind of coming up with my mind and, tr- and putting the price and time together. You know, if you also look at it in terms of price and, you know, any of your readers can look this up, look at XLF or KRE relative to the S&P, relative to the Dow, relative to the NASDAQ. It's not even close to coming into uh, those, you know, late 2021, early 22 highs. So this is what's known as technical price divergence. And it usually sends a warning. It doesn't mean there's going to be a huge crash, but it means that there's going to be volatility again, which is why I'm excited about this year. It's interesting that you mentioned the BTFP, the Bank Term Funding Program which, as you pointed out, ends March 11th. Uh, there was an article I saw recently where the banks are actually gaming this program, which, you know, oh, if yeah. they can, of course, they will. You know, once again, the, the way the Fed has managed interest rates has just created a, a kind of an arbitrage, you know, where they can borrow cheaper enough than they expected, and the Fed is paying them more than they expected <laughs> so they can just borrow and deposit and borrow, you know deposit with the fed and borrow and deposit and borrow and deposit and make money just, why, do, why you know. do anything else why do anything else yeah exactly exactly you know there's always an unintended consequence somewhere when the fed starts getting involved in a big way and saving people there's always an unintended consequence that usually makes a few people rich and frequently makes a lot of other, life more difficult for lots of other folks uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. So these are inflection points. We don't know if you're going to be long or short around these dates. You know, in other words, we don't know if, if these are going to be highs or lows, but the real point is that we think that this, these will be the inflections. And that's what all of, I just want to be clear. That's what all of these dates you gave me are, you know, whether it's a high or a low, you think it's going to be put in around those dates. Correct. Correct. Yep. Okay. That is fascinating to me. Like I, you better believe I will be like, I will be, uh, taping these to the wall in front of me. I will be watching every single one of them. There you go. Um, Well, here's the other thing too, is, you know, you guys know from seeing what I do every day, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be trading it and I'll be trading from the long and short side this year. There's no doubt about it. So I just wanted to give you guys and give your listeners a head up, heads up of, uh, exactly what I'm looking at. Yeah. It's very cool. I mean, we, we talk a lot here about have a plan. You know, as investors have a plan. Now, with your trading strategy, it's great that you can like peg things to very specific days in some cases, uh, weeks, you know, years, um, and make those decisions based on that. When if you're in a short term trading, I mean, you could go willy nilly into it and just go off gut, or you can actually like have set dates and times. I think is is very helpful. 
uh, if you're right. looking to get into this. That's right. And another way to look at this, like, we all know you can't predict the future, right? There's no system for predicting the future. And predicting the future would be to say price and time. I know what price and time are going to be with high conviction on this date, this time, this price, whatever. You can't right. do that. But you could certainly develop, you know, an idea based on, you know, in your case, these cyclical studies of one or the other. Okay. And yours is time. That's yes. the one that you have more conviction about. And to add to that, um, Dan, so that, you know, I, I think it's important for your listener to understand that, you know, and you, and you said it, you don't predict everything. And I always talk about it with both price and time. We're dealing with probabilities. We do not deal in certainties at all. Right. We're dealing with probabilities. So if I can tell you a uh, statistical measurement, and a lot of people, you know, they, when they, they, they read about GAN, they, you know, it's financial astrology. It's just complete crap. It's just not, okay? What we were dealing with is statistics. We're dealing with the mathematical probabilities of when a certain time cycle happened in the past and this happened with price. This is what we are thinking in terms of a probability that it could happen again. It doesn't, if it's a low or a high or a high or low, that doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but how the price moves into that time cycle, that's the probability of what I'm trading. Yeah. So a lot of people, and I get a lot of this type of thing from Sentiment Trader. We, we need to have Jason Gefford from Sentiment Trader back on. And they impute, they do what a lot of people do. They impute probability based on how often a certain thing has happened in the past. You know, they'll say, how often in the past has the S&P 500 gone up nine days in a row or something mm -hmm. like that, anything like that. And many things like that. Like they come up with a new one, it seems like every other day. And then they look back over a certain period of time and they say, well, you know, it's happened 17 or, or sometimes 50 or 60 times before. And 90% of the time the market went up or down or whatever in the next three, six, nine, 12, 18 months, whatever it is. So... You know, a lot of people do this. I think, you know, even um, quant firms do all, all kinds of stuff like this. So, you know, it's, it's not astrology. I mean, there is no system for predicting the future. And astrology <laughs> certainly is not a system for doing anything. But like you say, you want the odds on your side. That's all we're saying here is that, that Greg thinks the odds are good that these dates are inflection points. That's it, right? That's it. Uh, so specifically, um, I know you you publish a service called the Ten Stock Trader, and you've had some really great trades since you know. I know twenty twenty two, you were just all over it. Um, what specifically do you think you'll be trading? Can do you know that? Do you know like is it going to be like Russell two thousand S and P five hundred Nvidia? What do you, do you know what you might be trading? So I think specifically this year, and I, and I, this this could change, but I'm concerned about single stock names and trading single stocks because we're seeing so much divergence from a technical perspective. And I mentioned it with banks and the S and P, but we're also seeing it in tech. You know, um, just take a look at uh, Taiwan Semiconductors. You know, one of the biggest chip makers out there relative to an NVIDIA, relative to an AMD. You know, Apple to start this year is completely underperforming Microsoft and the NASDAQ in general. So I can say, at least for the first half of the year, I'm probably going to stick with just sectors mm -hmm. um, or just, you know, the S&P 500 or NASDAQ. I, IWM, yeah, probably. And then obviously I mentioned the banks. So XLF, KRE, uh, I'll probably stick with some of the sector stuff. And then maybe later in the year, once I, you know, kind of figure out where we are with the roadmap, if you will, you know, I'll, I'll dabble again into some single, single stop names, stock names, but I'm, I'm concerned about trading those individual stocks in the first quarter, uh, heading into earnings, um, specifically because of that divergence. And basically what that means is like, you know, you can see Microsoft pop and Apple, Apple drop, and it's just kind of all over the place. And when things don't line up as a technical trader or as a trader in general, that makes it difficult. So by sticking with the sectors, you know, it kind of smooths things out. That reminds me of something about, uh, you know, specific names versus versus sectors. We had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, Hari Krishnan, who, uh, you know, trades volatility and hedging and, uh, you know, pretty expert in, in all of that. And he mentioned just the the the, the the scale of moves that you see in the market 
like today compared to 10 or 20 years ago. What is your observation on that? Like say compared to like your hedge fund days and whether, you know, that affects what you look at or how you make a certain trade. Well, I mean, I'll take the bigger scale because I love volatility. Um, and I, I, I certainly think COVID changed things with everyone was working from home and everyone became a hedge fund trader themselves. Um, you know, so you're getting more people into the market and obviously the federal reserve flooded the market. And then you, you know, I mentioned it earlier, you had these huge swings in positioning and, uh, you know, whether that's due to, you know, an increase in the algorithms and the, and the herd mentality and they all pile in and they all pile out at the same time. Um, you know, Back in my hedge fund days, it was all I just traded futures and options and commodities. So it wasn't I didn't trade any stocks back then. But, you know, you still saw these huge moves. And, you know, it was a quant fund that I worked for and we took advantage of that. So I don't think that volatility is ever going to change. And, you know, the fact that we see these huge swings now, a reflection of the time cycle we're in, um, an inflection. <laughs> You know, Dan's talked about this in terms of the mega bubble, you know, how much more money can you possibly print all the time? Keep keep slushing around and slushing around. And, you know, you have more money in the system and you have more people involved in the financial markets. You're going to have bigger swings and we're seeing that. Um, so, again, you know, I I like it as a, as a volatility trader, as an options trader. So, you know, and even if it goes away, it's never going to go away. So you know, we're going to see these big spikes um, continue. Yeah, more money, lower volumes. Uh, fewer stocks. Yeah. What do you, how do you think that's all going to turn out? Right. <laughs> so over right. time, right. And other things too, that um, lead to that. We had Mike Green on talking about passive investing and, you know, and the, basically the big question there is what if the bid, you know, goes the other way? Um, I mean, cause it's this endless bid under stocks, right? So what, ha what happens if the algorithm reverses and instead of, receive a dollar of capital, buy a dollar of equity. It's, you know, redeem a dollar of capital. Oh, well, sell a dollar of equity at some point. It, you know, for any length of time, it doesn't have to be forever. It, it, it you know, it could be for a month or something. Um, big enough flows out would could create a problem, I think was the point we were making there. But anyway, this is a fascinating discussion because it's, it's nothing like, like, you know, we get... Macro guys who talk about macro things and geopolitical guys who talk about geopolitical things and fundamental value investors like me who talk about individual businesses and cash flows and competitive advantages. But I think you're actually I think you have a monopoly on this, Greg, amongst our guests. Or I'm just a, I'm just a yeah, weirdo. Greg you can is, just call Greg me a weirdo. weirdo. No, it's fine. <laughs> you, you do. You have a monopoly on this, you know, intersection of price and time and time cycles. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, a monopoly is not right because there's there's sure, a lot of, uh, you know, maybe we're there's a smaller the group, but there's, there's a lot of game traders. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How dare you? No, no. I mean, definitely within Stansberry for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but, you know, there there's a there's a little a group of, you know, so there's the uh, foundation for the study of cycles. Mm -hmm. um, there's tons of GAN traders out there. You know, just don't get the type of uh, notoriety. You're not going to see us on CNBC or Fox Business or anything. You know, because it, it does. It, it, it there's a narrative. There's a um, <laughs> you know, there's a consensus about you know, what works and what doesn't. So you know, I, I've kind of come full circle. It's like, no, you have to believe in this. And now I'm like, you know what? If you don't believe me, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> so because um, I've been doing it for 20 years and it's worked. So if you look, look if you want to, if you want to come follow me, great. I'll show you. Hopefully, I motivate you. And, you know, and show you some really cool stuff about how, what I've been doing and, you know, and some of the successes I've had. And if you don't, that's okay. But I don't, what really, I mean, it doesn't make me upset, but like, I love when people <laughs> were like, no, that's wrong. No, there's no, no time cycles that are going to do this. And I, I'm like, did you study it? Did you look at it? Have you invested with it? Have you traded it? Well, no. Then how do you know it doesn't work? Just because it doesn't align with what you've been, you know, conditioned to believe doesn't mean it doesn't work, right? right? So, you know, that's 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 kind of where I am. In all oh, that man, stuff. there's more than one way to skin a cat in the market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to, and to yeah, that exactly. point, I would say, you know, I read like everything that almost or try to read everything that, that we publish. And that's, you know, a good part of my job. And there were not many people either within us or everywhere that called like the top in January 
2022 and the bottom in October. And that was based using this time cycle analysis. And so if you don't take this kind of thing into account, I think you're missing something is all I'll say. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well said. Well that's said. right. When somebody's succeeding at something like, you know, and you're telling them, no, you're stupid and you're wrong. I mean, they're like, okay, thanks. Bye. I mean, who can, you know, why? <laughs> yeah. I just, I just laugh at this point. <laughs> all right. Um, so, I have to go back to, you mentioned IWM, um, which is something I've traded mm -hmm. before and continue to watch. I'm watching for, for a couple of things here. But you and I have also traded little bits of conversation over the past few years and noticed basically the gist of our, our comments, if you recall, is that thing behaves so much weirder than the other big indexes. I like to say it has a mind of its yeah. own. And, um, you know, well, so, you know, it's, it's, it's smaller businesses. I mentioned it earlier, but if you look at just the price aversions of the banks relative to the S and P, IWM is doing the same thing. Um, another index or sector really, it's not a major index, but is the iShares USA momentum factor fund. Huge. I wrote about this to start off the year, huge correlation between the S and P 500. Uh, the ticker is MTUM. It's an ETF, you know, huge correlation in momentum and S and P. And that completely died last year in 2023, just completely died. So again, you know, that's kind of a warning for 2024. And within IWM, there's a lot of regional banks, you know, KRE and IWM sort of mixed in there. So, you know, and then look at to the start of the year, look at, look at the relationship between IWM and Apple. It's actually the same move in the first, you know, few, few trading days, um, which is fascinating to me. So you know, again, I mentioned, you know, not trading those single stock names. We're seeing tons of divergence here to start the year. And that, again, tells me that we're on the cusp of some serious volatility. Ed. Yeah, I'm just looking at a chart of MTUM and certainly off that October bottom, it really came back to life. But look at it relative to the top compared to the S&P, you know, or NASDAQ. That's the divergence. Oh, I see. So you know, it peaked around the same time NASDAQ did. So just compare those two and it's, it's kind of sucked wind since then. So what does exactly. that tell you, Craig? What does that really tell you? It, exactly what I've been talking about. That's why I wanted to come on here. It tells me that we're going to have extreme, but and it, well, here's, here's another way to look at it. So let's, let's, let's take into the fact of the time cycles and let's say I'm right about what happens with the banks. I don't know if I am yet, but let's just say for, you know, theoretically I am. Okay. What we could see is an MTUM or an IWM, um, you know, KRE, or maybe XLF, but let's just take MTUM and KRE, all right? And what we could see, if this volatility is to happen, are new lows below 2022, below those October lows in an MTUM, an IWM, or even the banks. The banks would be the biggest one. But we see higher lows in an NVIDIA or a Microsoft or the NASDAQ. You see what, see what I'm saying? So basically what we have is we have this a huge flush out into 2024 that actually creates a big buying opportunity because then you have positive divergence where, okay, all these things are making new lows while the leading sectors like semiconductors and the NASDAQ don't. And then we have this run up, you know, for another year or two. So that's kind of the big picture that that is, you know, formulating in my mind, if you will. But again, you know, you're talking 12 to 18 months out. But that's how I could kind of foresee that situation playing out in the long term. But in the short term, it's like, hey, you know what? These things did not keep up in 2023. Therefore, new lows in these in 2024, you know, and then everything kind of goes back up after the right. election. So, folks, what Greg is talking about here. Um, so from November 19, 2021, NASDAQ top, right? Um, MT yep. MTUM yep. is minus 15 percent. KRE is minus just about 30 and SPX is up almost 2% since that top. I didn't do its top, but yeah. There yeah. You go. So it's, it's a huge divergence and, and Greg is telling us that, that this means something to him in terms of basically expected ball for, for the year ahead for the whole year ahead. I think it's going to be a rough ride for bulls and bears. I really do. I don't I think it's, it's not, you know, if you just looked at the NASDAQ in 2023 since March, it was kind of, a, again, you know, a nice uptrend sands a couple of months here, you know, in the summer. But I don't think that's going to be the case for, for 2024. I think it's going to be going to be volatile. All right. That's the message. Um, 
Greg, you, you have answered our final question once or twice before. I hope you don't remember what it is. Do you remember what it is? Uh, I usually go with risk management. Um, it's okay. one thing that well, if, I, if you go to an island so, what, or something yeah, yeah, like that. You're, you're close. If, if you could tell our listener, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? Right, right, right. So I, 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 don't, I, hate, I don't like repeating myself. You know, obviously, risk management is important when we talked about that. Let's see. What can I go with this time? One thought. Here's a good one. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in terms of have an open mind about what's possible. You know, when you looked at uh, some of the great traders of all times, they, they always talked about how the reason that they were so great and made so much money is because they never thought that, you know, if Apple was trading at 100, that it couldn't go to 300 or that it couldn't go to zero. Mm -hmm. So they always had an open mind about what was possible. Um, and I think that's an important thing to have, whether a st what stock is going to go to, uh, what stock is going to move what, or what it goes back to what we were talking about or what I do, you know, how do the markets work? How does time work? How does price work? How does understanding a good business work? You know, how does value investing work? Have an open mind about the avenues in which you can be successful in investing and trading. And don't be afraid to pursue it regardless of what other people think. So I, I, I like that one. I'm going to stick with that one. Sounds good. Sounds very wise. All right, Greg, always a pleasure, man. I love talking with you and I love having you on the show. Likewise, my friends. Good talking with you. you we're definitely going to have you back. Like, um, maybe we won't wait the whole year. Maybe we'll check in around June or so. Or maybe, yeah, maybe after, you know, two or three of these. Maybe after Labor yeah, Day. There you go. That'd be perfect. Right after Labor Day, all of these dates. Right before the election and then after the dates. Perfect. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Cool. Let, let's remember cool, to do cool, that. Cool, cool, cool. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Yep. All right. All right, guys. The Fed wants you to believe they've got inflation under control, but I believe we've only seen the beginning of a devastating new crisis. And if you don't prepare now, you could see your savings evaporate as inflation and interest rates soar even higher over the next two years. It all traces back to a golden thread that ties together the biggest financial calamities in America's history. But it seems the entire financial world is falling into this very same denial trap that led to massive devastation the last time this crisis played out. If you know your history, you know there will be winners and losers, and now is when you decide which one you'll be. I've spelled it all out in an urgent new report. Go to www.bankrun2023.com to get your free copy. I'll also show you how to get my complete playbook for navigating this crisis, including the three critical steps to take immediately. Again, that's www.bankrun2023.com for your free copy of my new report. Well, Greg Diamond is one of our own. He's a friend and a colleague, and it's always good to talk with him. I have uh, spent plenty of time with Greg and been absolutely, uh, shall we say, sh three sheets to the wind with him on occasion, and it's been a lot of fun. But isn't it cool, though, Corey, that like he gives us a framework of time? We don't know what's going to happen, but now I, you know, we're going to be laser focused on these dates of like. I'm going to be looking forward to Valentine's Day. And my wife is like, oh, he's so excited about Valentine's Day. Isn't that great? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, and all the other ones. Yeah, yeah, right. I, and that's, you know, what I mentioned there uh, in one of the questions about how it's it's as an options trade. If you're trying to trade options, I mean, you need to have some, you need to have a risk management strategy. And if you can mm -hmm. peg things to times and cycles like Greg does, I think it's, I think it's a no brainer. I mean, because what he, it's cool. what his subscribers know is that, you know, he'll so say he thinks something's going to happen. There is a big point in February or something. He will mm -hmm. be eyeing up, like he's saying, recommending trades up until that point or after it. But but with very specific targets, technical targets of of profit and and loss so like things that he'll get out at or or when, and when he'll get it and it just does it repeatedly over and over uh within this time cycle analysis which um you know i think i think once you kind of see it in action um you know it gets a little even more compelling um when you see these these, these different uh times and just and, and you know i sometimes i think like oh well 
okay, you could name any date and something important happens, but that, that is not the case here. It's, it's, um, it, he's really had a, you know, proven it over time that, that it works. Yeah, he really has, especially over the last couple of years. Yeah. He's done great. And I'm glad also that he mentioned IWM because per, I have a personal interest in that because I follow it and I trade it. And I thought, well, okay. I wound up not doing so great second half of last year. And I could have sort of backed off when I'm not doing well. I just back off. But now I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm aiming to figure out if anything's going to happen, you know, as of February 14th, like that's the next date that I'll be looking for just because this guy that I trust who studies this, you know, cyclical phenomenon, um, has given me that date. It'll be interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that he brought up the, the banking program, uh, you know, expiring in March, um, that's something that was on my mind too, uh, yeah, before the conversation, the last couple, couple of months, ever since we were at, uh, yeah. I, I was listening to one of the fed meetings, press conferences, and some uh, reporter actually asked Jerome Powell, was like, Hey, that, uh, program, um, expires in March. Uh, what do you think about that? And he goes, so he was like, what? <laughs> well, that's a good question. And I don't really know yet. And so uh, there will be some volatility around that, you know? scenario and whatever happens with that i think i mean like you mentioned there's yeah. the banks have been taking advantage of that they've kind of you know cashed in the reverse repo facility for this the new one from like this new one from last year and um right. or exchanged it and so yeah that, that'll be something i don't know if it'll you know crush the the banking system or or not but it's definitely going to change how they've been operating the last you know three four six months so yeah, that's a very specific target date in time, uh, and a very specific event. Yeah, which I think it's a got great potential for a buy the rumor, sell the news style trade. So if you you know if you think you want to be um, short because of that, you'd be you'd short ahead of it, and maybe maybe you'd buy, or maybe you would avoid the trade altogether and then buy that day. Um, and and vice versa, right? So it'll be a, it's a nice target, you know. And there's some decent fundamental reason. I mean, if banks are just kind of right now gaming it and minting money, and you see the balances on it have been rising um, quite a bit. So if you don't think it's because they're afraid of, um, you know, having problems and not being able to meet their depositors' demands, because that that was the purpose of it then you would have to assume that they're gaming it and that, and that when they stop doing that and the whole thing is withdrawn, um, you know, whatever, wh whichever way you think it goes, that, that would, that could help you form the basis for some type of a buy the rumor, sell the news trade is what I'm saying. You know, it's the first sort of hugely interesting thing that's kind of different this year that'll come along. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Greg gave us some good ideas about it, and he gave us some good ideas just about trading in general, as he always does. Um, I don't know. I, I just I always enjoy talking with Greg. A lot, lot of good stuff. Me too. I forgot to bring up the we share we share a uh, unfortunate fandom in the New York Jets football team. I forgot to bring that up, but may, <laughs> maybe right. next time. <laughs> maybe next time. All right, uh, which will definitely be sometime this year. Hopefully as Greg suggested, right after um, Labor Day so we can find out what happened on all these dates and what to do about it and what to do going into the election, which I think this year, I, I normally don't even express any views about this sort of thing, but something about this year makes me feel like volatility going into the election will be high. Uh, I think there's potential for you know, violence in the streets and God knows what else. Um, it, it, it is slightly scary to me. It is slightly scary. Yes. To say the least, uh, to, to me as well. I wrote, I just wrote about, I yeah. promised, well, I didn't promise anybody, but I, I, I wrote about the election, uh, today in the, in the digest as I was writing about it, just because the stuff I was hearing from both from Biden and Trump already, and we're 11 months out, mm -hmm. is just, it's painful to my ears. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just, you have Biden taking credit for job creation, which is, which was essentially just the unemployment rate going from 15% back to where it was at like around 3.5 because of just like, you know, like, like bean counting during the pandemic. 
and afterward. And then you have Trump saying that the, the economy is running on the fumes of what he did, which was, you know, throw, I, he's probably might be referring to the tax cuts too, but also 4 trillion of stimulus, which led to the 40 year high inflation, which then continued with 2 trillion more under the current administration. So there we are. I don't know. I, I, I love, I love when presidents, especially and other politicians take credit for what happens in the market and what happens, you know, over the economy short term, and they say how wonderful it is because of them. It's hilarious to me. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. Me- hundreds of millions of people waking up every day just like they've been doing their whole lives, but all of a sudden, this guy made a difference. I don't, you know, I don't. And meanwhile, that. Congress is uh, again <laughs> trying to figure out how to agree to spend more money uh, to keep the government open. <laughs> and that that exactly, is the only yeah. actual practical thing that's happening right now it is is that right and so but yes i'm with you on the concerns about the election um later this year although you know i was thinking about it today too like maybe the fact that so many people are concerned is a good sign um in that there, people have like a an eye out for yeah. for this i mean like, like 2020 kind of mm-hmm. i feel like took a lot of people by surprise uh, 20 uh yeah 2020 took a lot of people by surprise so um yep maybe there's something that I think that's how it works yeah maybe maybe we're on the you know getting through this this crazy political time but maybe not too. maybe maybe mm-hmm. maybe we still haven't seen what right. can happen and the other thing is uh, th- i think that's the way life works you know um and in the market too, if we get greater volatility, you know, that is sort of, um, th- those little bumps probably keep us from having bigger ones, right? So if we get lots of, you know, little runs of 10% up and 10% down, maybe, I, I, I suspect maybe that's what makes those, you know, rapid 30%, you know, two or three week descents <laughs> pretty rare. And so we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it all turns out. But, um, yeah, that's another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com, please. And also, do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call our listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. 
Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.